welcome to Brain Balance Live. This is a show where we talk about really uh, neurodiversity in families and how we can all just get along. <laughs> <laughs> this is Heather. Heather is a cognitive specialist. She's also a therapist and one of the National Autism Summit speakers. She also runs the Brain Balance Centers near you in Texas. Uh, so you're going to want to follow her at the hidden turn there. Heather, how are you doing today? Doing well. How about you? How's the yeah. weather there? Is it still summer or is it feeling a little cooler? It's still summer, but I will say I feel like in the last two days there has been a little bit like I noticed yesterday morning, actually, I got up and our air conditioner was on 76 and the temp, the thermostat read that it was 74 in the house. And I went, wow. What? So something's happening. <laughs> yeah. It, you? No, it's the same. Later on this week, they're showing like lows in the mid fifties at night. I'm like, what? That's a big switch. I love it. <laughs> love it. We are ready. Well, today we are going to be talking about flexibility. So often uh, our children or ourselves are, have a difficult time with this, right, Heather? Oh, man. Yes. This is something that's, I'm so sorry. Something just got in my eye right when we went live. Oh, um, <laughs> that is the pits. If you want to step away for a second, if you need to, I can talk to folks for a I second. Just, I'm so sorry. It just, everything was fine. It just happened out of the blue. If somebody's watching in an earshot, please bring me a tissue. <laughs> um, but this is a topic that relates to virtually any family. And um, a lot of times, um, individuals who struggle with cognitive flexibility, that is neurodevelopment. And um, there's even a specific part of our brain called the anterior cingulate uh, gy gyrus that is less active. We need a lot of brain connectivity for this to happen. It can look like, a, I always say, don't ascribe negative personality or character labels to things that have to do with brain differences. And this is one of those. So um, we, we can jump right into the slides and look at all the different ways we use cognitive flexibility. It's I mean, some of the obvious things are, I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, yep. not listening to someone else's perspective, seeing things very black and white. And this will come across very as defiance, opposition, stubbornness. But it really is, my brain has difficulty uh, seeing things from another perspective, putting myself into your shoes and seeing your point of view. So, I mean, this is important for learning as well as social skills. It impacts all areas of learning. Transitions. That's switching gears. So if your kids have difficulty at school, going from one activity to another or at home, it's playtime and now it's time to get ready for dinner or bed. I mean, this is flexibility. Switching attention. Uh, you know, there are many different types of attention. We did a show about that, but it's not just about the ability to sustain attention. In fact, most individuals with attentional issues, uh, if they're diagnosed with ADHD, often they pay too much attention to everything. It's not that they can't sustain attention on anything, but my attention is on this and now I need to switch gears and get it over here. So that, that is called, you know, switching attention. There are many different types of attention. Um, exceptions to the rule. The rule says this, or I think I know best. So this is how I think everyone should play this game. This is how I think this day should go down. And so there's that kind of rule when that can come across as very bossy. But the other part of this is sometimes there are exceptions to the rule. Think about um, I before E except after C in spelling. Sometimes the E does come before the I. And uh, there are exceptions to the rule in math and in, in reading, writing, spelling, as well as usually this is how we do it at home, but today needs to look different for a, a different reason. Having difficulty with changes, the unexpected. Um, being able to collaborate is very important for reasons we mentioned, because you, you have to know that you're not always going to get your way. You don't get 100 percent say on everything all the time and you're going to have to compromise. And that means I need to be able to see your point of view. Um, big picture. Some kids will get or, or adults. It can happen in any age. Get so honed in on certain details that they can't see the forest for the trees. And that is what takes away their perspective. The left and right hemisphere must be communicating and processing. Also, on a scale of zero to 10, how big of, a deal is, big of a deal is this in the big scheme of things? You know what? That was really a three, and I was acting like it was an eight. It gives you that kind of perspective for emotional regulation. Abstract. How about, um, you know, there, there are just, think if you have kids who are extremely literal, 
And I, I saw a, a picture where kids were told to put hands on all the clocks they saw in the picture and they literally drew arms and hands instead of <laughs> clock hands. So understanding that words can have more than one meaning, figures of speech, idioms, metaphors, similes, emotions are abstract, anything that you can't just touch and feel or you have to read between the lines and understand nuanced information. This goes back to divergent thinking. We, when we did the big picture show, we talked about convergent and divergent. It's not just about fact, 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 fact. There are also ideas and opinions and creativity here, thinking outside the box, creating a new box. Problem solving, this is paramount for problem solving. If your first strategy doesn't work, what's another way to attack this? This is so important because part of hope, there are three parts of hope. One is, I believe in a better future, optimism, I'm gonna set goals and pursue them. Agency, I believe I can do it, and pathways, flexible thinking. When I hit a roadblock, there are many different routes around that to the goal. So without hope, a lot of kids will uh, seem to be lacking motivation. They don't know what they do care about. Yeah. But I, I've given examples from literacy, math, there's more than one way to solve a math problem. So this is, and this isn't even all of them. So these are just some of the examples. We use cognitive flexibility all, the t all, all day, every day. Yeah. I mean, we don't even realize we're doing it sometimes if it comes more organically. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that kids have issues in all areas. I want to be clear about this. There might, it doesn't mean that all of these have to apply to indicate that there's something awry with cognitive flexibility, but it is more than what comes across as stubborn and argumentative and I'm the boss and I, there's only one way to see this. I was going to say, you read it. all of this list of things and times that you use this. And I think to myself, wow, this is like such an important skill. We use it all the time. Yes. I mean, it's, it's understanding that if you are rushing a loved one to the ER, um, is, are we going to indict this person for speeding or cutting someone off? You right. know, there, there are extra, ex, um, extraneous circumstances. There are so many different factors to consider in virtually everything we face each day. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on. I, here are some cute examples. This big time impacts how we follow directions. So in the first one, <laughs> it says it, it's like you're supposed to name the shape and, and to the right, it has square, rectangle and all of that. But this child is naming them Bob and Emily you said name them. So naming only means one thing. And oh, this makes me so happy. Right. I mean, these are so cute. These are real examples. Yeah. And um, draw a plant cell. This is science class. Identify the most important parts. So we're talking about the parts of a plant. And instead they're thinking a cell, they think of jail. And so they yeah. put this flower in a jail and said no windows and iron bars. Yeah. Find the difference between eight and six. Eight is um, curly. <laughs> but if you saw the whole worksheet, you would see that they can do adding and subtracting because when it's just 10 minus eight equals, they put two. Yeah. But you said, find the difference. There's a whole lot of, how are these the same? How are they different? That goes into problem solving, being able to make good decisions. Um, write these words in alphabetical order, apple, pumpkin, river, etc. They wrote each word, apple, the A comes first, E-L-P-P. -P. They wrote the words. That That is pretty rigid thinking. I mean, oh if you if you gosh. take a step back and look at the big picture, is that what's being asked? That is honing in on detail instead of thinking, what is the most likely thing that I'm being asked to do here? Write less than the less than sign or greater than. They just wrote or in every single blank. There were like six <laughs> of these at least. <laughs> And they didn't, they couldn't stop to think, let me step back. Does this make any sense? Yeah. Um, 0.5 or one. No, I'm supposed to be understanding greater than, less than. We don't even have the context for what was being taught in class that day. And they do. If your kids miss the big picture, and I want to share with you, a lot of kids miss the big picture and it's not evident. It can look like they're sloppy with details. But if I don't have a context in which to put things, details fall off the shelf. Yeah. A lot of kids will think about deep things. I, I've had a lot of parents who said, my, my child's really strong with the big picture because they think about life and death and, and their faith. And they think about these big things. That doesn't yeah. mean that when they're making a decision, when they're doing academics, when they're having a social conversation, that they are putting on a wide angle lens and considering things from multiple vantage points. It's not the same 
it doesn't mean they don't have depth if they're missing the big picture. So wow. I want to clarify that. Yes. But I just had to share some of these cute examples. So if your children are very literal or your teens, you said you're doing this at six o'clock at 607. The big picture was I was giving you a general overview when we're doing this. I did not mean six zero zero. Okay. Let's move on. If your kids correct details when you're trying to teach them a life lesson, that's an issue here. Have you seen the one that says, I like to blank. I like to blank. I like to blank. And the kid wrote, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. <laughs> I have not seen that one. That's funny. I have seen, when I was looking at these examples, I saw one where um, the, the instruction on the math test was, Write a formula in which, in any formula in which it's true that X equals seven. And their answer was X equals seven. Yeah. And the teacher went, really? <laughs> <laughs> and see, that could look like they're being lazy. I think that's pretty clever, actually. Yeah. I think it's clever. Um, I would not have counted that wrong. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. But um, clearly they were, they were supposed to write a more complex formula that could look like being um, difficult or lazy. There's actually a lot of ingenuity there and maybe they really didn't understand. Or like smart alecky. Sometimes I, it's yeah. hard for me to distinguish if he's being a smart aleck to me. Right. And the, the hard part is, and that was hard for me as a, a mom because sometimes I felt like so many of these things, do you kids try to manipulate? Yes. We have a lot of kids who are almost too smart for their own good. Um, and I, I did not want to be manipulated by my sons, but there were times I had to give them the benefit of the doubt. I would look at all the factors and if I could not make a determination, I was going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And that was, that was a toughie sometimes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but you've heard me talk about executive functions so many times. All of those examples we've looked at, they all require cognitive flexibility, but they require all of our executive functions working together. When, when you think of executive functions, I mean, you've got attention and time management and organization and prioritizing and task initiation, all different types of memory, et cetera. But the granddaddies of them all are these three, cognitive flexibility, impulse control, and working memory. So think about sometimes I don't even have time to look at the big picture because I just impulsively jump to an answer. Keep in mind that if kids are impulsive, if they are miss, missing questions on tests because they're rushing through, that is every bit as much a cognitive skill to hit the brake pedal and think through the whole question and what you're really being asked every bit as much as knowing the answer is, okay? And a lot of times what looks like careless errors aren't. It, it can be anxiety, it can be visual perception, etc. But if I'm impulsive, I don't even have time to think of all the different factors, look at different perspectives. Yeah. And that's part of regulation. If I'm not emotionally regulated, I might fly off the handle when someone doesn't agree with me. Working memory is, ah, I've learned something about this before. Let me pull information from my background knowledge and also use the facts at hand, manipulate these, juggle these balls to solve it. It's, it's problem solving, task completion type of memory where you're using short term and long term memory and looking at all the factors that are relevant. How do, what if I don't know what's relevant and irrelevant? What if I just have a preset rigid belief that only this matters, only what I think matters? So you cannot really, it would be very difficult to think of many tasks in life where all three of these aren't working together. These are the granddaddies from which all of the other executive functions come. Yeah. Um, but a really good thing I mentioned problem solving is to create a problem solving wheel. Have your kids create one, better yet, depending upon their developmental level. Remember, Sometimes we have to fill in certain blanks for kids and we have to explicitly teach things, explain things that neurotypical kids may organically understand. But do little probes to see where they are and have them fill in the blanks that they can. So I noticed you kind of you're kind of at a stuck point on this math problem. What's another way you could solve it? Or it could be an issue with a friend. And, you, could, you know, this problem solving wheel has all different kinds of things like talk it out, walk away, do your, you know, self-regulation. If it's math, what are some different ways to solve that? You know, talk to my study buddy, look at my textbook, whatever it is, have them come up with things they can do and which things have they not tried yet. Um, and be sure that when you're facing problems and 
it, this is called problem solving, but it, it doesn't even mean a, like a problem. Like you were planning on cooking something for dinner and you realize you're out of a key ingredient. Yeah. Just talk about those things out loud. Huh. I was planning on making blah, 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 vegetable soup for dinner and we have no vegetable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what should we do? You know, and sh showing that you're calm when things don't go smoothly, when you're driving behind the wheel, that's a really good time to model um, this. <laughs> but <laughs> problem solving wheels are excellent. And they're a visible, tangible reminder that there's more than one way to get to a goal, more than one way to solve a problem. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. I have to be honest, I don't model that very well in the car. <laughs> so... I, I don't see your, so it's not a halo around your head that I usually, <laughs> no, no, I don't think, I, I doubt if very many people 100% of the time model that, I, you know, wait, I wouldn't model that 100%, a lot of, most of the time, yes, not always. Yeah. But usually if I am impatient with something, because people cutting me off and stuff like that, it's because I put myself in that position by rushing and yeah. had I gotten on the road in time, that wouldn't have, so then it's on me. You yeah, know? it's true. I guess as long as we go back and say, you know, I was frustrated because I actually didn't prepare myself well enough to leave on time. And so I was really frustrated with myself. And the good thing is when we're talking about modeling for kids, we're not talking about being perfect. Yeah. They actually will relate to us better when they realize that we are imperfect human beings. Yeah. But you catch yourself, you say it out loud, talk about, you know, these are some things I sh could have done so we wouldn't have been in as big of a hurry. Yeah, that is perspective. That is flexible thinking. That is emotional regulation. That is a more valuable lesson than if you're perfect all the time, really, because they can't relate to that. I can't. Awesome. We, none of us. Nobody's perfect. Um, but understanding that flexibility is a huge thing behind emotional granularity. Y'all have heard me talk about one of the biggies for being able to control emotions. Part of its impulse control. Let me hit the brake pedal and think before I speak and act. So if my inhibition or impulse control is not working well, I'm going to be impulsive. And then I'm going to lack a lot of times behaviors and emotions follow. Remember, that's communication. I'm overwhelmed. I'm facing something I don't have the toolkit to handle. But another part of this that really involves flexibility is granularity of emotions. Understanding that there is more than infuriation and completely distraught and anxious there is frustrated, disappointed, uncertain, glum. Think about all of the different layers of emotions. If your kids are a zero or a 10 in emotions, everything's great, everything's horrible. That is flexibility. So you want to teach them when they talk about, I'm so mad. We don't tell them they're not mad. Huh? You know what? I faced something similar one time. And, you know, at first I thought I was mad, but when I really thought about it, I was just a little bit frustrated. I was just a little disappointed. Talk about what the differences in the words are. Give them three other words to describe that emotion. Depending on their age and development, it could be a couple other words. Because grow emotions vocabulary, once we know those are possible, we actually start experiencing them more. The more I have flexibility in certain realms, the more it starts translating into other ways as well. But, um, you know, practice when to use various emotional concepts. You can, you can give even hypotheticals. And how do you think you would feel if that happened? Or how do you think this person in the book felt when this happened? Why? Yeah. Talk about different emotions. When, if they're really heightened, that's not the time to do it. We always need settling time. So you're talking to their logical brain, not their emotional brain. But teach them to reframe emotions. And sometimes when they're feeling anxious or scared, um, maybe they're excited. We're not denying a feeling that we're giving them the positive side of the coin. Yeah. So, um, Teach them, especially when, as they get a little bit older, if they are anxious, if they do have a lot of fear, teach them things to ask themselves. This is really important for self-regulation. Am I in danger? Could this not in my stomach be just physical? A lot of our kids, if they get a weird feeling in their stomach, that is what sets them off. They don't use it as just like a little yellow warning flag to use a self-regulation strategy. They, they feel a knot in their, their stomach and they think the end of the world is coming. So yeah. And giving them sort of some scripts to use with themselves is really helpful. I love that. Okay, let's move on. So what else can we do? Lots of things. Um, talking about those scripts, what's another way of looking at this? 
instead of us telling them another way to look at it, let give them a chance to get there on their own. If they can't, then ask, ask them that and then give them some options for them to consider. Jokes, riddles, wordplay are so fantastic. I have some examples of that, but but it's it really helps them understand that uh, a lot of words have different meanings. I can hand you something. This is my hand. You know, there are so many hom homophones, homonyms, all of that. And it that grows a ton of cognitive flexibility in addition to literacy. And bonus, by having them laugh when you're doing this, you're releasing neurotransmitters that make the brain more engaged and ready to learn. You know what's really funny? And I don't know if this ties in here, but the other day, Corey was really frustrated. And so he got a little yelly and a little angry. And he went out of the room and I looked at Roger. I said, oh my gosh, he's so mad. Isn't that hilarious? Just, I mean, don't laugh at him. It's going to be mean if we laugh at him. We kind of like, and we had a little chuckle and he was like, oh yeah, he's mad. And like, we like laughed over it. And like, he was so calm when Corey came back in the room. I was shocked. <laughs> Laughter is powerful. It's not just like, oh, laughter's fun and it gets it it chemically changes our brains and our emotions. Yeah. yeah. So I love that. I love that story. We just and, had a little moment. I was like, it's fine. Yeah. He's just mad. You're fine. Yes. And you know, you want engagement. So strategy and logic games, there are so many games um where they're having to use strategy logic. You need to look at things from different vantage points. You can do this with building things. You know, how many things can you build using these blocks? Um, teach kids it's okay to disagree. In addition to the actual activities, sometimes people are going to disagree. And it doesn't always mean that one person's right and one person's wrong. Two people can be right. Maybe neither one is right. Maybe there's not a right and wrong. That's really difficult for a lot of kids to understand that sometimes there's not an absolute right and an absolute wrong. Yeah. And come up with examples of when that is the case. Um, I, I put up a quote yesterday um, from Eleanor Roosevelt, but it's, it's be flexible, um, but but firm in your in your principles. It can be really difficult. We're not talking about being wishy washy. Being flexible is not weakness. Uh, I know a lot of things are are changing in the modern world, but there is still a certain expectation sometimes of boys being macho, being masculine. So they may think that bending is weakness. They're supposed to be tough. There's still, that does still exist a lot in a lot of places. And so they need to know that sometimes it's stronger to bend than to be unbendable. Sometimes it's when you won't bend, that's when you break. Yeah. And talk about those things that are convictions and core values versus things that are very negotiable. That is an extremely important conversation especially to start having with tweens and teens. And I'm talking about developmentally. It's always that not chronological age, but, okay. but that is one thing that's confusing. You know, um, we have these firm beliefs and I, I don't give into peer pressure. This is who you are and this is what you stand for. And yet I'm supposed to be flexible. So does that mean if somebody offers me to do drugs, I'm going to be flexible. Maybe that's not yeah. wrong. I mean, to have those conversations, we can't assume that kids can differentiate what is negotiable and what isn't. Yeah. And that is, those are different answers in each household and each person. And how um, to approach it socially even like, okay, like, yes. yes, I want you to have a hard line, but in your mind, but when you verbally say it to someone, you've got to say it in a way that sounds like I'm not judging you and I'm not whatever, but yes. you know, like, <laughs> yes, social, emotional books and social stories are so good for that. Y'all know that I love freespirit.com. I'm going to give you a very specific one about flexibility that I've shared before, but it, I, no way we could have the show today without doing that. But it's really great to read kids learn through stories, including teens, including adults for that matter. Yeah. And and when you take emotion out of it, they can use their logical brain and you can have very logical conversations that they can then transfer to their lives. Especially if as you're having these conversations, you make it relatable and ask questions like, does this remind you of anything that you're facing with your friends? What, you know, what, how? Um, and get them opening up about it. Yeah. Um, ch changing game rules, shoots and ladders go um, down the ladders and up the shoots. What? Yes, you can do that. Change rules, maybe connect four is connect six. This teaches them that sometimes rules aren't carved in stone. Sometimes rules don't apply. Sometimes they it's okay to bend them. Sometimes what you think is a rule doesn't apply because of this reason. That is so everything you said just now upset me. 
<laughs> I need to order. And see, we need to, and this is another, this is so abstract. Most of the time, kids um, who have difficulty with flexibility are more concrete thinkers, and we have got to intentionally teach them the abstract. What are some rules? Can you think, you know, name a rule. Can you think of a time that ever wouldn't apply? And you can apply it to a sport they're into. Um, what their the karate rules are at, at a tournament. Are, are those always the rules at all the tournaments? Why, yeah. why not? You know, apply it to things that they're interested in to get the engagement. Have them make up a game. And then on round four, you switch the rules. That requires cognitive flexibility. It is so important. Um, I've been saying this, but model it aloud. It's not about just being flexible and hoping your kids notice it. Your kids are watching you, but they may not pick up on that was cognitive flexibility. So you need to talk out loud about what happened, what you're thinking, and how you're using flexible thinking to find a workaround. Um, change up the routine. Kids need routine. They need structure. Yes. But there are going to be bumps in the road. So if there is one, maybe just take it the next level. I mean, if your kids are going to have a meltdown, pick your days. Maybe it's on a weekend. But shake things up on purpose. And, and then help them. They need this because maybe they had a play date planned and then Jason got sick and, and now they are screaming and crying. It's the worst day ever. And they're not even thinking about what can we do that's fun instead. Yeah. Um, do you think that Jason will be over, come over a different time? Um, but look for those times in your own life, but talk about them out loud so that they are connecting the dots because just seeing you do it doesn't necessarily uh, accomplish that. Um, I'm going to show you a, so a social story on the next page and um, problem solving. Will I already showed you that sort by one attribute, then another you can. Um, if any teachers are watching, you can do this with classmates, like sort people, sort the class by different attributes. So it can be boys, girls, and they can realize, you know, blonde hair and um, brunette hair, people who are into sports, people who aren't help them realize that the same group, it's not defined by one characteristic. I need to consider all of this. You can do this with laundry. You can do it with blocks. You can do it with any toys. You can do it with cards. You can sort cards by the number, the color, the suit, et cetera. Big time growth for cognitive flexibility. And learning about categories helps me with big picture mental schema thinking. Big time. Um, how many ways can you use this empty um, toilet paper roll? How many ways... Give them random, you can even have them pick an item out of a, a um, like a pillowcase where there's an element of surprise and fun to it and go around, maybe even the whole family goes around and they can't repick something that somebody else said. How many different ways can we come up to use this item? That's a fun way to do it. That's also good for parties, by the way, for kids. Yeah, that sounds fun. There are so many, these are just examples to get your creative juices flowing. There's so many ways to work on flexibility. Love it. All right. Let's move on. And just to show you, we talked about laughter, but these are some really good word plays. I'm organizing a hide and seek tournament. Good players are hard to find. <laughs> and, you know, um, how much did the pirate pay to get his ears pierced? A buccaneer. Yeah. I told my contractor I didn't want carpeted steps. He gave me a blank stare. I think that was funny. Uh, <laughs> what did the surgeon say to the patient who wanted to close his own incision? Suit yourself. Oh, that's funny. I lost my girlfriend's audiobook. Now I'll never hear the end of it. Um, that's <laughs> funny. Anyway, there are a million of these, but there find ones put, you can put in your child's age or developmental age, and you can find lists of puns. And once kids learn these, they'll love being able to go tell their friends these jokes too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can even have them write story with some little word plays in it where the characters are using that kind of dialogue just to make it fun just be creative with it yeah i love that okay let's move on we've got a couple more things to look at here y'all have heard me i think probably before talk about superflex and rock brain google superflex they have amazing books amazing activities superflex helps you look at things from different uh, perspectives rock brain stuck in his thinking and so you can, once you read these books, and if, if your kids are kind of showing rigidity, you can say, are you having a super flex brain right now or a rock brain? What would super, what does your super flex brain say? That kind of thing. Ah. And I wanted to show you the super flex comes in all different nationalities, male, female. You can find one that's very relatable 
for your child, which I love. Yeah, that's and, awesome. And one really good way to lead into this is to have a bunch of items, um, yarn, string, hangers, bricks, rocks, all kinds of things. And like, is this rigid or flexible? So give them a concrete, tangible manifestation, a slinky, you know, um, where they can understand the concept of flexibility and rigidity first. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, kids often need concrete depictions of this, and then it can translate more easily into flexible and rigid thinking. And then sometimes that, we talked about using code words before. Yeah. Uh, you could just be like super flex. <laughs> you know, you can do little things like that where someone else may not, your little cue if something's going sideways when they're engaging with a friend where they know what it means, but it's not embarrassing and you're not having to come down, down on them. <clears throat> but, um, that is, there, there are others. There's like, I don't like the word no, but super flex. There are many activities. There are even cards you can get that have different scenarios on them. The resources for super flex are amazing and they're all over the place. If you That's Google awesome. that, you will find them. Yeah. I love that. Okay. We're almost done. Uh, this is a really good saying from Brad Stuhlberg. Um, flexibility without strength is instability, but strength without flexibility is rigidity. And being rigid is neither fun nor particularly effective in getting you where you need to go. This, this really speaks to what I was saying. This is such an abstract thing about you want to be grounded in your values, but you also have to be flexible. What does that look like? There are so many. I highly recommend pulling up flexibility quotes. There are some amazing ones out there and having a quote of the week and talking through it with the, what does this mean to you? What does it mean to you? And then kind of have that be the, maybe the guiding post for that week's activities and um, to really get this concept of flexibility kind of to take root. I absolutely love that quote. I am absolutely going to write that down and read that to the family today. I just think that's brilliant. It is. It is amazing. Yeah. I love that one. So, so good. Thank you so much, Heather, for everybody watching. Uh, or if you're catching this on the replay, you saw us prompt you guys a couple of times, please write your questions in. Heather is always happy to answer. She answers most of the messages, as many as she can herself. So please, please, please contact her at any of these locations, get an assessment today. If that's something that you're needing or interested in, uh, they're here to help. Brain Balance Centers is here to help. Heather is, it's her mission to help. So Heather, I can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being my my, my buddy on this show. I, I really, it's so much fun doing these with you, talking mom to mom on here. I love it as well. So, so much. Um, oh, do you have any more lives this week? Yes. Dr. Brian and I will be back Thursday. I'm so glad you at 3.35, but um next Monday, we're going to do a, a, in case you missed it show replay, because um, I, my friends are, I, I have a little surprise happening and for my birthday, and I'm actually going to take, have a little downtime, which I don't do that often. And I'm kind of excited. Oh my gosh, Heather, there is no one more deserving. I'm so happy <laughs> for you. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, happy uh, early birthday. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Yeah. I, I lost count. It's a big number, but it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> I'm excited. Nah, you are so young. Don't even go there. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, we will catch you on the replay next week. Make sure you catch her and Dr. Brian on Thursday. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye, Heather. Bye, Jen. Bye, everyone.